All right, so we'll get into this one. So, just following on the sequence of lessons, um, again, in sector, so we're jumping around a little bit, like I've said already. So we've, uh, what did we do last? What was our last topic? Amides, right, we did amines, amides, we did S's before that, then we did triglycerides, um, and now we're jumping over to uh, carbohydrates, aren't we? All right. Can I ask that what you do is, when we're doing the carbohydrates section, is the book hasn't got a lot of detail in it, so I've given you an extra handout. This comes from an old textbook, um, and it's, it's called Chemistry 2001, written by um, Stanley Joyce and Reynolds. So um, that one there is useful as a supplement. Okay, it goes into a little bit more detail compared to what we need for the topic. All right, now, if you've ever had uh, sugar or any food with sugar in it, or if you've ever had, nobody's ever had sugar, bread, it's pretty hard to have a sugar-free diet, okay? At some point, uh, you have ingested carbohydrates, okay? And if you are at the Olympics right now, Okay, I can guarantee, looking at some of those um, people that have been doing the events like the rowing and the cycling, um, at some particular point prior to that match, they would have had a pretty big carbohydrate loading. A lot of pasta. A lot of pasta. Okay. So, it links up nicely um, to, you know, just basically stuff in diet, but it also links up structurally to what we've been doing already in organic chemistry. All right. And we'll talk more about that, and we can also link it um, to fermentation to produce alcohol, not so good for your system, but we can also link it to combustion, because we use carbohydrates for respiration in the body. That's how I'm moving right now, because I just had my carb loading at recess, okay? Maybe it's not being consumed right now. Probably tea last night is getting digested at the moment. Oh, what do we have? We had pasta. Ah. We had pasta, see? That's why I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right, so carbohydrates. So if we're following through the textbook, there's a couple of things we have to be familiar with for carbohydrates. And the first thing is, what do they look like? So I've got a few examples of carbohydrates on the board, but they all have got a general formula. And the thing that I forgot to say up here, all right, was that there's two ways of looking at it. We can either use this system or this system to work out the formula, and where x um, is always equal to y. So if I use that and jump down to the structure for glucose, the formula is C6H12O6. Okay, in this case, obviously x is 6. Okay, 2 6s are 12 and 6. And we could use this formula and we get the same answer. They are called polyhydroxyaldehydes or ketones. Now we haven't done polymers in the course yet, but hopefully you can work out that polymers, um, as with our structure over here, all right, um, this, is, this is our monomer, this is an example of poly, this one here, polyvinyl chloride. So the green is the chlorine, we've got a double bond there, and if we add those end to end, we end up with a polymer. So poly means many. So this means many hydroxy groups at an aldehyde in the structure. Well, on that topic, okay, of aldehydes, if I had glucose, and we'll do this in our silver mirror, we actually use glucose, believe it or not, um, as the aldehyde in our test for silver mirror, because it always gives a really good result. So here it is. So this glucose in the straight chain version would give a positive silver mirror or a positive tolerance test. All right? And that's just characteristic for glucose. And any other carbohydrate in that form with an aldehyde would give that positive test. All right, polyhydroxyaldehydes or polyhydroxy ketones. All right, that's all we're after. And we know what a ketone looks like. Jack? Oh, good, I'm pleased you asked. Okay. Because there's two versions of glucose and there's two versions of most carbohydrates. This is called a straight chain version. This is called a cyclic version. We did that right at the beginning when we talked about how do we name organic compounds. We started looking at cyclic compounds and we didn't look a great deal at benzene. We just said we'd just put them over there in the aromatic 
okay, um, area. But we did look at cyclic aliphatic compounds. That means they haven't got a benzene ring in them. So these are cyclic compounds, or they can be in a straight chain, a straight chain aliphatic. And the equilibrium means to say, all right, that it dominates the cyclic for all carbohydrates. So they prefer the cyclic arrangement. As you can see over here, I've done the disaccharides. I haven't done a straight chain version, obviously. The cyclic is preferred, okay, for all of the sugar units. Most of the time we find them in cyclic. There are structural isomers of this as well, but we don't go into that at this level, all right? So straight chain or cyclic, you can draw glucose like that, or you can draw glucose like this. They're isomers of one another. Same structural formula, sorry, same molecular formula, different structural formula. Okay. Uh, so this says draw glucose in tests, would it matter which way you draw it? Wouldn't matter, but I prefer that one because I think it's the easier one to do. But it wouldn't matter. Wouldn't matter, no. Um, so you can just draw glucose in either one of those. Not a problem. Okay. When you're drawing, and if you are asked to draw sugars at any particular time, then it's not easy to do. All right. So in terms of drawing glucose, this is just a way that I've sort of worked out over the years, it's easier to draw a six-membered ring first, as if you're beginning to draw benzene or cyclohexane. And then all you're doing is you're replacing one of the carbons with an oxygen. And you have to do that. Alright? Because all it's... Sugars. Sorry? All sugars. All sugars are the same, yeah. If they're based on a six-membered ring. As we've got over there. Alright? And so then all I do is then I know that each particular point, okay, by this one here, this is going to have an OCH2OH, and it's going to have six carbons, alright, in the chain in total. Then all, all I do is I come back, and where I put my H as an OH doesn't really matter. Okay, it could be down the top or up the bottom. All right, it's still going to give me the same outcome, the same formula. So when you're drawing uh, glucose, that's why I think it's easier to do it in the cyclic form. But be aware that you should be able to do it in linear form as well. Matt? Why is there an H on this one but not on that? A water? No H, where are we missing? Okay, on top, on the top left of the um, glucose. Glucose. Yeah. The glucose. This one here? Yeah. Should there be a H underneath? Oh, yes, you're correct, yeah. So, again, because I've got the simplified version, alright, this one here, one, two, three, it's only forming four bonds, so yes, they have no H in there. Okay. My bad, missed that one out. Alright, so this is the structure, alright, that we can use to draw glucose. If we're going to do a, or one of the um, five-membered rings, a simple sugar, like this one, this one here, okay, is fructose, so I'm gonna replace that with an oxygen there, and we have got a CH2OH sticking out of there, and according to our structure in the book, we've got an OH, and then we've got an OH, H, OH, We've got another CH2OH there, and we have to have another hydrogen there. So fructose is drawn as a five membered ring. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, but still, car still six carbons in the chain. Okay. There they go. Does this sort of complicate? Does this really matter for where you write? No, it doesn't. I said that a minute ago. So you can have the OH on top or the bottom. It doesn't matter. Okay. Not in this instance anyway. The only thing you have to be careful of when you are drawing it, and I think I've been a little bit slack in some of these diagrams, see this one here? Yeah. All right, so if you had like OH like that in the exam, that'd be marked wrong. I think I've been to that before. So you've got to make sure that it is bonded to the oxygen in the OH unit. It's only minor stuff, but it's one mark here, one mark there, all right? No, I know, but it adds up, okay? All right, so, that's basically the general formula and structure for sugars. They're divided into three groups. We talk about simple sugars. Simple sugars are called monosaccharides. It's got only one glucose or one unit in its structure. And the examples that we're looking at 
are glucose and fructose, they're a single sugar. We call them mono, mono meaning? Oh, I was going to do a bill stand. One, one, okay, only one. Disaccharides, two, all right, two sugars. So the example I'll put up here is maltose. The other thing I forgot to mention is that you'll notice that all of these have got O's at the end of the name. Glucose, okay? So that's another common characteristic of carbohydrate as well. So maltose is commonly known just as malt, okay? Um, and another example of a disaccharide is a sort of sugar that we find in honey, sucrose. Sucrose is a double sugar. The example, have they got it in the book? No, they haven't got an example of sucrose in the book, but sucrose is a double sugar, okay? Very similar uh, to maltose. So it's, very, it's going to be much thicker, okay? Why is it thicker, or I should say more viscous to be accurate, but why is it um, more viscous? Compared to glucose, it's a double. double sugar. Mm. The thing is, though, what state do you find sugar in? Solid. Normally, it's solid, isn't it? Okay. And the thing is, with the with these, they're normally liquids, aren't they? But very viscous liquids. Something to think about. All right. But these things here, polysaccharides. If we jump down to a polysaccharide, in what form are those things? They're always solids. Okay, so starch is an example of a polysaccharide. All right, the example that we're given is cellulose, makes up the cell wall for plants. So hopefully, you can work out that it is fairly rigid, it's a very strong structure. All of these compounds, okay, will be able to absorb water. Why can they absorb water? OH has got multiple sites for H bonding. To be specific, things like mono and disaccharides will be water soluble because the water can surround those structures. What about polysaccharide? Water soluble? No. Nope. Okay. I hope not, otherwise, all of our trees will be lying flat in the ground. Okay. But they can absorb moisture, but they certainly can't be dissolved in water. So we want them to be able to absorb a certain amount of moisture. Okay. On that point, um, if we think about diet, and I mentioned starch earlier on, starch is a polysaccharide. And people say, all right, if you are not regular, all right, you should increase the fibre in your diet. Fibre contains starch, okay? And, funny enough, the starch in your system is able to absorb water and it helps you to go to the toilet a bit easier. So it's all connected to chemistry, all right? So that's how we look at it like that. From a fermentation perspective, do you remember when we talked about fermentation of alcohols? Depending on the complexity of the sugar that we started off with, we change the structure. So if we're talking about, say, producing something like, say, um, say beer or something, beer will start from this complex carbohydrate, the starch that we extract from the wheat and the barley, then it undergoes hydrolysis to a disaccharide, and the disaccharide undergoes hydrolysis to glucose, the monosaccharide, and then the yeast come in and it does a fermentation to turn that into our alcohol at the end of the, end of the, of the actual phase. If we're starting, so it's talking about something like mead, mead would come from a disaccharide. Mead, yeah. Start some honey, okay. You ferment the honey, all right, with the yeast, obviously, turns into glucose, glucose, okay, into a form of um, alcoholic, again, uh, alcoholic drink called mead. So we could we could also start straight, straight with glucose, and I talked about just using glucose um, as a primary source to produce ethanol, okay, and that is done, all right. Uh, some people do that when they produce spirits, and we call that that's a spirit. So pure alcohol is known as a spirit. So it's semi-connected to the stuff we've done already, okay, in the alcohols. It's connected to what we've done in terms of solubility of compounds, based on H bonding, okay. And anything else that we need to touch on, that's it, solubility. React oh, of course we mentioned aldehydes as well, all right. Any questions about the carbohydrate? Because that's really all we need to cover for the carbohydrates.
Question, Matt. Which one's healthier? Which one's healthier? For the body, starch is always going to be healthier. Which one gives the most energy? You tell me. Starch. Starch. All right, but no, it's a good question. All right, because uh, if you watch the Tour de France recently, and it was and, and the cyclists, if they you know if they were doing their two hundred forty k's and they were going through um, the the mountain stage, which is where's that? That's in um, yeah, but what was it called? The um, Pyrenees, okay. So if they go through the Pyrenees, for example, and they've done their 25 kilometre climb with a, you know, with a gradient of 10 percent, which is huge, okay. Um, then they, the, the, the commentators are talking about this magic drink that they have called Coke. All right. Yeah. And so what they were doing is that they'd actually, you see them if you're watching uh, that event, they they had a can of Coke while they're riding. All right. And why? Well, the Coke has got 12, 13 teaspoons of sugar, it's glucose. The body doesn't have to actually undergo any digestion at all. You get an immediate hit of sugar. But the problem is that it goes like this. You get a peak, you use it, and then you go down again. Okay? So, in terms of how we actually use this to our advantage, it's fairly obvious, maybe it's not so obvious, but sugar will give you an instant um, energy boost, okay? But that will only go for a short period of time, all right? Because your body's going to utilise it. Ultimately, all the food ends up as a sugar, okay? So you can undergo combustion. So we're talking about uh, things that have got complex carbohydrates in them. We talked about pasta a minute ago and, and bread, all right? Um, and so that those those foods they're called low GI foods, okay? They break down slowly over time. So if you've got a stomach like me from last night from having my pasta meal, um, so I would have um, lots of carbohydrates probably sitting there and starting that digestion process. And as I exercise, it's going to slowly release the energy that I need. So I'll be able to sustain physical activity for a long period of time. Versus eating nothing, okay? So if you don't have breakfast in the morning, it's probably not a very good start to the day, all right? Or simply having sugar on top of sugar, on top of sugar. And that's got other side effects as well. Anyway, that's not in the course as such, but it's just interesting, and that was a good question, all right? So it'll all generate energy. The point is, is how quickly the energy is allowed to be taken up by the body in respiration, okay? Any other questions? Stom, Marty? Is the bottom of 296? Yep. Is that in the course? Yep, glucose as a reducing agent. Yes, it is. All right. So all we're talking about there is the Tonnell's test. All right. So it's a reducing agent. So it's actually it's oxidised with Tonnell's, which we did in Silver Mirror. They're just high highlighting it uh, slightly more in that little section. All right. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah. All right. We'll have a bit of a break and then we'll go through questions.